Venus is the only, or there's only one other place in the solar system that's an equal bastard place to study, and that's Titan. <laughs> What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? So NASA has captured the first visible light images of the surface of Venus from space. So the Parker Solar Probe, which has been investigating the sun and the solar corona for a couple of years now, um, pointed its whisper cameras at the night side of Venus as it flew by, um, which are designed to capture faint features of the solar wind flowing from the sun. And it captured some beautiful, We can, uh, if we can get them up, where are they? Some beautiful images of the dark side of, uh, or the night side of Venus. So we're going to be discussing those today. And to discuss them, I'm joined by Paul Byrne. Paul, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing, man? I am not too bad. First question for you is, have you seen the film that we've been discussing for the last couple I of haven't. Months? I haven't seen it. I've been really busy and I haven't seen Moonfall, but um, in the before times, I would often catch movies on airplanes Yes. where the alternative is to either go asleep or try to open the door. Um, and, and I think Moonfall perfectly falls into the category of movies that if I, if I have to be awake, I'll watch. I have, I have heard some not very generous okay. use of it. So I feel watching on a plane is probably the best use of my time since I'm doing something anyway. I haven't, I haven't either, actually. So, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll get around to that eventually. Catch up after we've seen it. Then. Exactly, we got to we got to do a, a review. So, just to remind everyone, Paul's been on the channel before, but he's an associate professor of Earth and planetary science at Washington University now, and his uh, research focuses on comparative planetary geology, and he loves all of the planets except for Mars. So, Paul. Why are these images so exciting? Why is it so hard to catch a glimpse of the surface of Venus using visible light? Why was there such a, a hoo-ha about these images a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, okay, so basically what it comes down to is Venus is an absolute bastard planet to try and photograph from space. Yeah. And the reason is because it has this really thick global layer of sulfuric acid clouds. Yeah. And those clouds block light in visible spectrum, which means that if you were, in fact, even this image, is is Venus in ultraviolet light? Oh, it if is. If you were to look at it, if you were to look at it with your eyes, it would be an almost featureless kind of white ball. <laughs> That's why Venus is so beautiful in our in our evening or our morning skies. It's the even star, the morning star, Lucifer, one of its names. You know, Lucifer, right? Light. It's bright because it reflects a huge amount of reflects, but seventy percent of the light it receives from the sun yeah. because of these bright clouds. So to see any cloud structure, you have to use inter ultraviolet or infrared, which is what these are here. And you can see this. This is big kind of like bow wave looking structure. Yeah. Very pronounced structures in the clouds. You don't see this with visible wavelength light, with the light that our eyes see. But you can't see the surface at all. At least that's the thing they're thinking. And the way we've been exploring the Venus surface from space remotely for the last 40 years is by using radar. Radar is able to penetrate through the clouds and see the surface. But a radar image isn't quite the same as a photograph. That's sort of the problem. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, a version of what you'd see, but it's not like looking at an image. You don't get a lot of the fine scale stuff that an image will give you. It doesn't quite give you the same perspective. Now, that's not to say that, v that radar isn't extremely useful. And most of what we know about the geology of Venus, some comes from those handful of images we have from landers, almost all comes from radar. Mm -hmm. So the view for the longest time has been that you cannot see the surface with visible wavelength light or, or even light, even a little bit in the UV or the infrared, mm -hmm. and, and you have to use radar. Now, it just so happens that there was an instrument on a, a mission called Venus Express, which was a European Space Agency mission launched in 06 and operated Venus until late 2014. And it had an instrument called Virtus, which was designed to look at the lower atmosphere and, and you mm -hmm. know, with near infrared. So one micron or so, you know, visible, visible wavelengths go up to around 750 nanometers, or 0.75 microns. So a little bit beyond that in the near infrared. Mm. And Virtus was able to see through the clouds. And it turns out that there is a few, what we call these windows. There's a handful of them. And, and these little windows are very narrow places of the electromagnetic spectrum where light from the ground actually reaches up. Mm. Now, the light isn't being emitted from the ground. Right, it's, well, well, actually, let me back up and say, technically it is, and I'll, I'll talk why in a moment. But the point is, light from the ground reaches you mm. in space 
without being scattered and absorbed, which is what almost all light does otherwise. Is, it, is this kind of like the windows we have on the Earth? There's a there's an infrared window that we can yes. put. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like that. And you can see, for example, through rain clouds, if you have mm. you know, these kinds of windows you're looking mm. at. But the reason, for example, if you're in an airplane and you look down on the ocean, part of it's to do with light reflected off the top of the ocean. But the main reason, at least from space, that we don't see the ocean floor is because light scatters. It doesn't reach the ocean floor to bounce back up. It gets scattered by the water. That's basically what's happening in, in Venus's atmosphere. It's not just the clouds, actually. The atmosphere itself scatters light, at least in the day side. So Virtus was able to show that there are some parts of the surface that you can kind of see. You can see these kind of splodgy outlines. Yeah. I'm use a complicated technical word there. Splodgy <laughs> outlines that look like the same shapes we know are there with radar, which yeah. are in a much finer scale. Mm. And that's motivated people to go and develop instruments, which we're not going to fly. Within the next 10 years, there are, there's three missions, three new missions on their way to, well, under development to fly to Venus, two of which will have instruments with basically near-infrared cameras designed to see through these little narrow windows. Amazing. What was really interesting about the Parker Soda Probe Whisper Camera is that, like you say, it was designed for looking for these thin filaments, right? It, it's got very, very sensitive sensor, but it was it was not the only reason Parker Solar Pro was going anywhere near Venus is to get gravity assists to get basically closer and closer to the sun. That's yeah. the point of what it's doing. Yeah. It's just visiting Venus on the way. But they were like, let's just turn the camera on. Let's point to the Venus and see what we see. And lo, so there, there we, we there start we are. to see. Now, okay, so what we're seeing on this, on, on the left-hand side, is the Venus night side, right? That's the night side of Venus, okay? And most of those dots aren't stars. They're particles, high energy particles that are flying around hitting the center of the detector. If you were to look at the, at the day side, when this image was taken, it was just a white disk. It'd be completely saturated. Right? Yeah. Now what's on the right-hand side, this is a composite image. This is a radar map of Venus mm. with topography. And in this case, the color, which is completely artificial, the color <laughs> corresponds to elevation. Red stuff is relatively high. Yep. Green stuff is sort of middling elevations and blue stuff is relatively low. And by the way, this is a separate conversation. There is in fact sort of a sea level we have for Venus. It's, it's made up, but there is a reference data. So the point is that, and this is a mirror image, right? One is, one is a mirror of the other. Yeah. That big region that's kind of pinky, whitey, reddy. Yeah. We see that, that's a high standing plateau. That's a big highland called Aphrodite Terra, this is what we call it. And it, its shape is visible yeah. through the clouds. We can, we can see this sort of dark light. image here. That dark image yeah. is, is that thing there, that red area there, that kind of pinky yeah. red area. Yeah. Now, here's how light is working on Venus. Sunlight, so we're seeing the night side of Venus. So first off, how in the hell is there light coming out of Venus at all on the night side? I was, uh, that's what I was going to ask. What what has changed in this in this case right. that we can now see through? Is it is it is it just a a fluke that the the density of the atmosphere has changed in some way that we can see basically, so basically weather on Venus, or is it or is it something something else? So first off, we have to talk about why we can see the surface at all, mm. and the reason we can see the surface is because it's really really hot. Yeah. Right. So so the the temperature I've said this before, the temperature and pressure at Venus, self cleaning oven. As a 470 Celsius, mm. and the pressure is 900 meters under the water on Earth equivalent, right? Yeah. 90 bars, 90 times room pressure. So what that means is it's really the conditions there are, are not kind, and they are certainly <laughs> not kind to the spacecraft, and they are definitely not kind, kind to life. Now, the other thing, too, is as you go up by a kilometer, yeah. the temperature drops by around 8 Kelvin or 8 Celsius, right? So if you change three kilometers, that's 24 degrees. Yeah. It's not a huge difference if you're starting at 470, but it's enough. <laughs> And what we're seeing here is this. Remember, I mentioned that with topography here, right? This is an area that's elevated. This Aphrodite area, area is red area. Yeah. It sits a few kilometers above the surrounding mm. plains. And the reason it looks darker on this image is because it's a little bit cooler. Yeah. And that's why we can see its outline. That's how uh... it stands away. If the surface was completely bland and flat, yeah. It would be the same color everywhere. Yeah. Now, you may still ask, why is there light at all on the night side? And the reason is because it's so hot, the rocks are glowing. <laughs> but in the infrared, if you were to be in a spacecraft looking at Venus, you would just see a, a dark disk. Yeah. Right? If the sun's on the other side, it's the night side. Yeah. 
But if you were to see in infrared, somehow, by the way, these images are, are black and white because infrared doesn't really have a color, right? You could colorize it, you can make it look red, but you can make it look any color you want. But if you were there, if you somehow had the ability, some snakes, for example, see in infrared, if yeah. you brought a snake for some reason, <laughs> actually, I don't know what wavelengths it can see in. But the point is, if you could see in the near infrared, you would see glowing, you would see the ground. Yeah. And the reason these windows exist, which is your question, why is it that there are these narrow windows where, where you, know, you can see something? Yeah. The reason is because you have photons coming up off the ground in a variety of wavelengths, mainly near, in, in the infrared. And by, by virtue of just the chemistry of the atmosphere, CO2 and the sulfuric acid clouds, those, those basically photons get bounced and scattered. And they never reach the upper surface or the, the, the edge of space. They never get to space. But those photons that have a particular energy that corresponds to this particular part of the electromagnetic spectrum, because of physics, they can get up and they, and they escape. And we can see the ground glowing in the near infrared in these handful of windows. Mm, so this, amazing. oh, now, OK, so the good news is this offers a way of seeing the surface of Venus mm. from space, right? We are used to having transparent atmospheres yeah. like Earth or Mars or no atmosphere like Moon or Mercury, yeah. where, where there's, no, there's no impediment to seeing the surface. Venus is the only, or there's only one other place in the solar system that's an equal bastard place to study, and that's <laughs> Titan. Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, has a thick mm. methane smoggy atmosphere that you can't see through. And to get to see the surface, you have to use radar, which is what the Cassini mission did. Now, I don't know if there are equivalent windows on Titan, but there are for Venus. Now, that's the good news. You don't just need radar. You can see something. You can tell something about the surface using infrared. Because all, we've had, bad, all we've had before is this, right? Are, this, 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 this is the it. only images we have. The yeah. images from the landers are the only images yeah. we have on the surface. Now, the, the downside to being able to see the surface in near infrared, if you're looking at this from space, there's still a huge amount of blurring. Mm. The clouds act like a frosted window. So <clears throat> you imagine you've got your hallway, right? And you can see it as someone at your front door. But if you've got frosted glass or glass with texture mm. or whatever, it smears it. There's very little detail. Yeah. You certainly can't read the stitching on their hoodie or something, right? <laughs> That's the same issue we have. Yeah. If we are imaging the surface, even in near infrared, yes, we can begin to pick out gross scale features mm. like Aphrodite Terra, but you can see, you can see on that image, even though that's a relatively low resolution radar image with, with relatively low resolution topography, you can see much finer scale structures. You can see tiny things and ridges and all kinds of stuff. You cannot see that in the near infrared because you have this, this frosted glass effect, this smearing the cloud layer does. Some people have proposed that if you were able to be in the Venus atmosphere itself, and if you could somehow get under the clouds where it's pretty hellish, but not, not as hellish as the ground. Yeah. You could actually photograph the surface in the infrared wow. at night, and you could see features. It wouldn't be a photograph in the conventional sense. It would be close to what Predator sees. It would be near infrared. Right? Amazing the, film, by the way. So yeah, Absolutely, like right? That. So you, you, you And you could render it in the same color that the Predator sees. Yeah. Right? You could actually pick this sort of, you know, this kind of We should color. definitely, that is definitely something that should happen. Like, so, I, I think it should be too. You could, yeah, I mean, you could, you know, you could call your spacecraft that. But what you, it's possible that you could see the, the ground from a 40 odd, 46, mm. 45, 47 kilometers up in, in near infrared at night, rather than using sunlight to illuminate the ground, which is what we're used to doing in most places, we would be relying on that reflected thermal energy, that near infrared light coming up, and we would be able to see the ground. And, and we would look for contrast as a function of different material mm. properties and also topography. Bits that are lower would be a little brighter because they're hotter than bits that are higher, just like we see in this image here. How, how would that trade off between the resolution we can get with radar and the resolution we can get with infrared? Because I, I guess the, the resolution we could potentially get with infrared would be higher naively? Yeah, yeah, it could be, absolutely. Depending on your sensor, depending on on how big it is and how long you photograph the surface and how, what your altitude is, you could potentially get resolutions. I mean, you could also get really high data resolution for radar too. It mm. really depends on, on how powerful your radar is, how big it is, mm. how much energy you have. Ultimately, all that traces down to how much money you have. And that's the, the arbiter <laughs> of everything. But you could certainly get, you know, you could certainly get a much finer resolution. The smearing, this kind of frosted glass effect you're getting from space above the clouds means that the smallest features you're seeing are maybe 50 kilometers across yeah, yeah right it's fine for global scale mapping which we'll get with these new missions and that's going to be extremely important to be able to do the first 
I mean, one of the main ways we get information on what stuff is made of compositionally is we go and we look at stuff in different wavelengths and figure out what that means chemically. We are going to be able to do that for Venus because we are going to be able to say with these different windows, I can see a different kind of response, a different spectral signature for different rocks in different places. And once I can rule out the effects of the, their elevation and their relative temperature, I can start to say something about what they're made of. This is more iron rich than that, for example. It won't be definitive, won't be the same as landing and measuring, mm. but you can begin to sort of make geological maps, chemical maps globally. We have them for the moon, we have them for Mars, we have them for Mercury, we have them for Earth. We do not have them for Venus that, because and of that's, the nature of the atmosphere. And, and that's Predator 2 when he's uh, shifting between all the... That's the exactly when, it, when exactly all those different things where you're able to see those guys in the mean house and slaughter <laughs> them. Gary Busey, amazing movie. Yeah, that ability of comparing stuff. You know, maybe there's a this sort of a teachable thing here by again using Predator as as a proxy for remote sensing yeah. spectral data, but you end up being able to say much more than you can right now. Yeah, and that's that's the exciting thing, and we may be able to see that in the next ten years or so. We'll hopefully start to see a much better handle on what the actual chemistry of the rocks and Venus are. We don't have that information so far. I just, I, I just find it stunning that essentially you're using the the light from the day side and the heat that that is bringing to the to the rocks on the night side is then so hot that it's emitting in that infrared to give off yep. light on the other you're side. You're looking That's, at these uh, rocks glowing, yeah. trying to cool themselves down. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's kind of wild. Absolutely, it is wild. Um, are there any other? So you mentioned a few of these things. We see these streaks, these particles on here as well. Are there any other um, useful insights that we can um, get from these pictures? Because I've I've heard some people mention um, a couple of things, which were let's have a look in here. The Venus dust orbital dust ring. Yes, yes. So now I don't know. Can... Does that come from this camera whisper? Not or because sure. because Parker Cell Probe's got an array of instruments, but yeah, it turns out basically that there is a large like, charged particle plume following Venus. It's not quite like a comet, but it's it's not a million miles off that idea moving around the sun. It produces essentially a belt of these particles. And Parker Cell Probe has flown through that material. And we did not know that material was there until you equip a, a mission like Parker Cell Probe mm. with the correct instruments to be able to go and measure these. It's just, it's every time we go somewhere with new instruments, <laughs> we learn new stuff. And and often it's fortuitous, right? Like I said, Whisper was not designed to photograph the surface of Venus. It was designed to photograph space. And yet here it is telling us the information about the surface of Venus, which I think is is just incredible. So are these are these particles streaming off the atmosphere of Venus or... Some of them are, yeah. We know that Venus is losing atmosphere. We know actually that the rate of atmospheric loss at Venus is roughly about the same order of magnitude as the rate at which Earth is losing atmosphere and Mars is losing atmosphere. And that, of course, ties into all these other questions about how atmospheres are replenished and whether you need a magnetic field. It is worth pointing out, by the way, we have we may have said it before, people have often regard a magnetic field as being important for hanging on to an atmosphere on account of the fact that Mars seems to have lost its magnetic field 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, has very little atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Venus has no modern internally generated magnetic mm -hmm. field. It's got 90 times the atmosphere of Earth. <laughs> so it seems having no magnetic field does not appear to be an impediment to hanging on to a thick atmosphere. Um, but some of these particles are streaming off from, from this. Is what, they are, what they aren't, uh, as far as I understand, are particles of like rock blasted into space. Mm. But that is how Mercury has what's called a sodium tail. Mm. Mercury is essentially a big rocky comet. Now, when we're thinking of comets, we're thinking of these big bright, plumes you can see right there's and, and comets have two tails right they have an ion tail and they have a dust tail in the case of mercury because it has no atmosphere stuff hits it and the atmosphere is made of minerals which contain things like calcium and magnesium and a bunch of other elements that build up minerals build up rocks and we know that there's basically a plume of sodium that trails off behind mercury and wow. those sodium ions which get charged by the sun come from the sodium inside mineral grains, mm. which are kicked up by micrometeorites. So basically what you're seeing is you've taken the rock on the surface of, the, of Mercury, which is volcanic, and you're taking rock forming elements, you're breaking those minerals into their component elements. They're then lofted. And then the coolest thing about it is electrical energy from the sun mm. shines through this sodium cloud yeah. and makes it glow yeah. exactly like how a sodium streetlight works. Mm. 
and and we think that if you were somehow able to get a human onto the surface or, or a lander with with cameras in the visible wavelength if you got them onto the night side of mercury because if you're on the day side you're dead mm. if you're on the night side where it's as cold as the moon and therefore you're okay because we know how to do that if you happen to be at the right time of the month or really or really of the mercury year around the orbit of the sun you could potentially have be bathed in this very dull orange glow because the sodium basically like almost atmosphere it's too thin to be called an atmosphere it's called an exosphere but this cloud of sodium ions are being basically electrified and they're glowing and that's just it's almost like an aurora it's not the same as an aurora but you have this glow i mean that's crazy right yeah. we've never seen that but but it's something you could potentially see Amazing. There's some amazing stuff out there. Yeah, I can't remember what no, your question the, the, was. <laughs> no, it was I a lovely. It was a lovely segue. We were talking about this this, this dust cloud, <laughs> and we went on to we went on to Mercury. There was there was one other thing that that was mentioned, which was this this idea of a of a tail ray as well. Maybe that's that's linked to this. He talks about this comet like tail of plasma. Maybe that's exactly what we were what we were talking about with the dust cloud. Um, is there anything else? that we can think of with Parker. What what is the what is the future of this? Are they going to make another pass, potentially take another uh, set of images? Yeah, and you talked about yeah, the, yeah. you talked about how we can use this information going forward as well. Yeah. So there are there's there are more Venus flyby scheduled for Parker. There's at least one more. I think there's several more. And, and certainly depending on a function of where the spacecraft is, how fast it's going um, which way they can point it, uh, the ability to get, you know, where it is relative to Earth and Venus when it's happening. All of these things play into whether you can turn the instruments on safely, whether you can acquire data and beam the data back. Particularly since those flybys are sort of seen as a foundational part of a mission itself, rather than science, they're necessary for it to get the solar science that, that Parker Solar Probe needs. Uh, I don't know if they have observational campaigns this is not uncommon for spacecraft to go and and make opportunistic science mm -hmm. discoveries as they fly in fact parker solar probe wasn't the first spacecraft to try and peek nor was venus express to try and peek through the clouds because the galileo spacecraft which flew uh to uh jupiter and operated at jupiter from 97 through 2003 did a flyby of venus many mm -hmm. spacecraft of the outer solar system use venus as a gravity slingshot uh, okay. and in there i don't think Galileo with its VIMS instrument was able to see the ground, but it certainly saw deep into the cloud system with the wavelengths it was looking at. But Galileo was a Jupiter system mission, and yet they were able to get Venus signs. The messenger mission to Mercury did two flybys of Venus and took images of the surface of Venus, and also a bunch of measurements of the magnetic field there and its interaction with its atmosphere and the sun. So anytime something goes by a planet, it's a good idea if you can afford to in terms of safety margins and data and energy. It's a good idea to turn your instruments on because you don't know what you're going to opportunity, uh, opportunity collect. I don't know if the Parker Center Probe team has decided to adjust their science plans for the next encounter mm. uh, on the basis of what they did with this one. I, I, I imagine they will if they can. Sometimes there are constraints that mean they can't. Mm. But certainly what's next, I mean, aside from opportunistic, cool science at Venus, mm -hmm. Parker Solar Probe is telling us how the sun works. Yeah. And, you know, this thing is going to get ever closer and ever faster mm. and breaking its own speed records as it falls downhill, hurtling towards the sun. And, and very soon, you know, it has already passed within, you know, a couple of solar radii of the mm. surface of the sun. I mean, you're getting almost as close as you can mm. before you, you start to run into real problems with the spacecraft. Mm. And it's working and it's returning these data. So Parker Solar Probe is an amazing mission. Uh, both in terms of its what it's able to withstand, but also the science is telling us yeah. not just for the sun, but for Venus too. I was just looking at the um, some of the some of the notes I made. Apparently, the next two flybys, the geometry won't be right to get the right. night side, but they will have another chance in November 2024. Apparently, which is on the um, does it say here? It doesn't say exactly uh, the seventh and final flyby. Apparently, okay. So okay. they might get another chance to do this then, which will give them plenty of chance to to have a look at whether this is possible. So that's uh, that could be an interesting opportunity. You also mentioned the opportunism that scientists often employ, which is really really interesting. So whenever we can get a little bit of extra stuff, we always want to do that. Yeah. A couple more that they mentioned here. Just final point was. Um, they said the ESA Bepi Colombo mission and the NASA Solar Orbiter would have decided to do uh, flybys as well in the coming years. So it looks like this is going to be a common 
thing that we try yes, to do. Yes, so. it will be. Yeah. And Bepi Colombo is an interesting mission. Bepi Colombo is, is ESA's, it's a joint ESA JAXA, so European Space Agency and Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. Uh, they're basically um, they've built this two dual spacecraft thing called Bepi Colombo. By the way, I, what I really like about Bepi Colombo, I like a lot about Bepi Colombo. Uh, if you look at American missions, you know, you've got Messenger, which is a long acronym. You've got Pioneer, <laughs> Voyager, Galileo. Bepi Colombo is named for a guy, name of Giuseppe Colombo. Bepi was his, you know, nickname, who helped pioneer and develop the idea of interplanetary flybys to get gravity assist. I was hoping so you were going to start talking about the detective, but but we're unfortunately not. Well, but it's on slightly different. But what you end up calling this mission, it's a bit like calling it Paddy Smith. <laughs> Bepi Colombo, that's the guy's name. It's one more question. Um, but Bepi Colombo, by virtue of how difficult it is to get to Mercury, and it is extremely difficult to Mercury, get to Mercury safely. Let me put it this way. Mercury is so deep inside the sun's gravity well. Mercury is, it's got the same gravity as Mars, even though it's smaller, but it's much, much closer to the sun's, deep in the sun's gravity well. Getting into orbit around Mercury is extremely technically challenging in terms of the energy you need, because the second you leave Earth, you're going too fast, mm. and you need to slow down to get there, unless you have this giant you know, warp edge, which we don't have, right? So you have to do lots of these flybys. In the case of Messenger, I think it did something like, and it was like six, one of Earth, two of Venus, three of Mar Mercury flybys. And on the fourth encounter, Mercury was going sufficiently slow that its relatively small engine was sufficient to keep this thing to, to circularize its mm. orbit. Bepi Colombo was a bigger spacecraft. Uh, it's quite big. It's two spacecraft all together, plus a transfer module. And it's using solar electric propulsion rather than a chemical engine. So it has to take a lot longer. So it's doing, it did one flyby of Earth. It's doing, uh, I think, it, again, two flybys of, of Venus and six flybys of Mercury. Mm ever spiraling in um and bepi is going to give us more information the way i kind of frame this people is you can get to mercury really fast from earth in the same way that if you were on the top floor of a skyscraper you can get to the ground really fast but you won't survive you won't be in any <laughs> shape to do any science once you get there yeah. uh, but if you want to get there safe you've got to take the stairs of the elevator mm. uh, and in the case of bepi colombo it, it is it has done its two venus flybys now but it is also in the spatial proximity of the sun mm. so is nasa solar orbiter and you now have a small but growing fleet of spacecraft in the inner so the inner part of the inner solar system, able to take measurements of things like magnetic field strength, and you know they're not dedicated solar or well solar or, uh, uh, but being able to go and actually get a sense of what's happening in from the sun and trace that to the effect, say for example, on planetary atmospheres as the sun is producing these prominences that lead to coronal mass ejections, these solar flares. It's a form of science that is enabled by the fact that you've got a bunch of different spacecraft in different parts of the system at one time. And in fact, Bepi is going to, the reason it's two is there's a small module called the called MIO, the Mercury Magnetosphere Orbiter, which is built by the Japanese. They will separate when they get close to Mercury. And the larger spacecraft is the Mercury Polar Orbit, or Mercury Planetary Orbiter, MPO. And MPO will be closer in a new, more circular orbit to the surface of Mercury than MEO or the Merc Magnetosphere orbit, which will be farther out with a more eccentric orbit. But for the first time, we'll be able to measure essentially what the sun is doing to Mercury at two places simultaneously, two distances from Mercury. And that's going to be hugely important to understand how its magnetic field responds, for example. Mercury is the only other planet in the solar system aside from Earth that generates its own internal magnetic field. We don't know why. Or maybe it's better to say we don't know why Venus doesn't, and we think Mars did and doesn't anymore. Understanding how that magnetic field responds to what the sun's magnetic field is doing, and what it, all the particles it's sending out, will be extremely useful. And, and Bepi is going to give us that. So really, my point here is anytime you have spacecraft near things, you can do opportunistic science. And the more spacecraft you have in a volume of space, the more cool simultaneous measurements you can make, which open up a whole new realm of science that a single spacecraft by its own, no matter how capable, just can't hope to do. Amazing stuff. Had had one final point that that it raised uh, that was raised this week. Um, obviously, there's some horrendous things going on in the world, and and one mission that was that seemed to have got canned was a joint. Um, I think it was an American Russian mission because of the obviously the geopolitics. I think that was was that a Venus mission, and is, is that a big problem for the years so going forward? The, or? Yeah, there's a whole. I mean, I don't even know if we know what the fall that is. What you know. Russia's illegal or lawful invasion of, of Ukraine is and what that's led to. And it's it's being made a pariah by the international community. And, and one of the many ways in which that that, that exclusion is being manifest is, uh, and it was actually Russia that pulled the plug. Okay. There's a concept that, that Russian scientists have been working on for a long time called Venera D, mm. which would have been a kind of revision of a revisiting of the, the Soviet landers that generated these images. 
back in the 1980s and 70s. Um, <clears throat> Venera D was a paper spacecraft, right? Nothing had been cut or bolted or welded. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't clear that there was ever going to be money for Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, to actually follow through and fly mm -hmm. this. But there had been a, a joint study team mm -hmm. between Russian and US based scientists that had led to a report. There'd been several meetings, including one in Moscow I attended in 2019. Um, this is of absolutely no fault of the Russian scientists themselves. Mm -hmm. But the Russian government cannot be allowed to participate in the peaceful exploration of space as they're doing this on Earth. And so basically, Russia pulled out of having international partners for Venera D, which affects a little bit Europe, mainly the United States. It's also had knock-on effects for things like ExoMars, right? The, the ExoMars Rosin Franklin or, uh, rover scheduled to launch in September of this year, now essentially on hiatus, because originally it was going to be launched on an American rocket. That didn't happen. That fell part years ago. And it was going to fly on a Russian-provided proton rocket. Now that can't happen. I don't think it should be, and I called for it not to be. And I'm gratified to see the European Space Agency essentially suspend plans. Uh, the problem is, um, by virtue of orbital dynamics, you can really only launch to Mars every 26 months uh, to do so affordably, which means that a delay of September 2022 means that November 24 is when the next window opens. Now, by then, hopefully we'll have long since settled the question of who builds the rocket, who sends it, uh, whether or not ExoMars would need to be adapted to fit on a different launch vehicle. You know, Any delay of any kind costs money. Yeah potentially threatens the actual project itself. Again, that has a huge negative impact for European scientists, early career scientists who are hoping to work on this mission. It just unfortunately is a, it reflects the fact that it's extremely difficult to, when you have a partner who does these kinds of things. I'm not sure we've even, I mean, right now, even today or tomorrow, the OneWeb satellites were supposed to launch, which are partly owned by the UK. Uh, and video came out in the last few hours mm -hmm. of uh, Russian engineers in the rocket basically taking the United States and the uh, UK flags off the mm -hmm. rocket. I mean, it's hard to know what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and, and the people who, who benefit, who, who suffer the most from this are the scientists, mm. um, which is usually the case. So I don't know where things are going to go. Yeah, that's a, that's a shame. So a sobering end to a, some very, very fascinating. Um, well, let me just, let me, let me just finish on this point then to invert it. On, the then. stuff we can do when we have nations cooperating. Yeah. Just look at the space station, look at Skycrane, look at Parker Solar Probe, which you have engineers and scientists from all walks of life, from all different nationalities and, and ethnicities. The stuff we can do when we work together is astonishing. I think we're seeing that. And solar system exploration is proof of the fact that when we stop acting like jerks to each other, we can really <laughs> just stuff. And it's good incentive to keep doing this and pursuing the peaceful collaboration of space exploration. I think that's... Uh... You, you brought you brought the the energy back into the room. That's a really nice uh, nice place to <laughs> to end it. So Paul, thank you very very much for for taking the time today. I really appreciate it as ever. When you've uh, when you've got to watch uh, Moonfall, I want us to have a a little chat about I think that. We should have. Then. Yeah, I agree. Well, I agree. We can commiserate with presumably what is a terrible movie. But we should watch it. It's our duty. I think we always we always knew it was going to be Paul. I think I think we were <laughs> we did we, we, we did. were trying to we were, but but that doesn't mean it can't be fun to watch. So we'll, no, exactly, uh, it doesn't have to be good to be fun. So. Ex exactly right. I will make sure all of um all of Paul's links and socials are down below. So head over and check out his stuff because it's always always really fascinating. He's got some of the coolest photos and images and papers you will see on Twitter. So head over there and have a look at that, particularly if you're interested in what's going on in space. Paul, thank you very much again. I know you've got My to pleasure. run off and get your papers ready for a, for a conference. So <laughs> doing actual science, which is... Actual science, which I don't get to do very often, but I'm going to have to do some now to earn my keep. But we will talk again soon about Moonfall. It'll be an absolute pleasure. I look forward to it. Have a good, uh, have a good evening, buddy, and we will uh, talk soon. Cheers, Sam. Sounds great. Thank you. See you later, buddy. Take care. Take care. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.